the quantum mechanical model. This was revolutionary. Um, and this, this was developed in the early, early 20th century, so around 1900-ish, that era. It's revolutionary because electrons do not behave like particles flying through space. There are two kinds of physics. There's Newtonian physics, um, named after Sir Isaac Newton, the guy who sat under the apple tree and you know the apple fell on his head. Newtonian physics um, is the physics of, of visible objects, large objects. You, know, you throw a baseball and you can predict where it's going to go. It has a trajectory and a velocity, and it's predictable. And where it's going now, the this velocity and the direction predicts where it's going to be in the future. And that those are things we understand. When we get to the very, very small, mind-bogglingly small, that doesn't work anymore. And electrons are so small, they don't have to behave themselves. So instead of orbits, which are nice to visualize, we have quantum mechanical orbitals. So there's just this little AL added here, orbit, orbital. So it's a little like an orbit, but it isn't at all. So an orbital, orbital represents a probability map. So it shows a statistical distribution of where the electron is likely to be found. So we can say, okay, here's this, this orbital, this region of space. The electron is probably in there somewhere. That's very different than saying the electron is traveling in a circle at this distance from the nucleus and at this velocity, and it's going around like that. The problem with Newtonian physics is it doesn't, under, it doesn't explain how an atom can even be stable and exist. Because if that were to happen, the electron would be constantly giving off energy and glowing, and it would be losing energy, and it would gradually fall into the center of the nucleus because it's attracted by this positive-negative charge difference. So why doesn't it stick to the nucleus? Newtonian physics can't explain that, but quantum mechanics can. So this idea of the um, statistics so comparing baseballs and electrons. Here we have a pitcher, and he's thrown a baseball. And that baseball's path can be traced and predicted as it travels from the pitcher to the catcher. If the pitcher throws the baseball exactly the same way every time, it will go to the same spot every time. Really good pitchers can do that. Or if you think of a pitching machine, the pitching machine shoots the baseball out the same way every time, and it goes to the same spot. If you were able to do that with electrons, even if you used a machine and shot them exactly the same way, it would land in a different place every time. It does not act like a baseball. An electron does not act like a baseball. Electrons and photons have wave-particle duality. We saw how light acts as a wave and a particle. Electrons also act like particles and like waves. So if we think about pitching electrons, if you threw the electron in exactly the same way every time, you would get sort of a distribution of places that the baseball, I mean the electron hit when it reached the catcher. So perhaps 20% of the time it would be in this center circle, 40% of the time it would be within this larger circle, 70% of the time it would be within this larger circle, but 30% of the time it would be outside that circle. It might be up here sometime or down there, I mean it could just go anywhere. It doesn't happen with baseballs, thankfully. So we need to understand the, the ideas of the orbits and the orbitals. The orbit's a circular pattern, a path like the orbit of a planet around the sun. 
And this was where in one of my classes, this particularly interesting student raised his hand in the back and I called on him. He said, how much do telescopes cost? You know, he, he got off on solar system, right, and was thinking about stargazing. Like, I understand that you daydream and space out in here, but don't ask me to price <laughs> toys for you. I just could not believe it. It was just too funny. Solar system, orbits, electrons going around the nucleus. Predictable. Unfortunately, not how it actually is. An orbital is a probability map showing a relative likelihood of where an electron might be found. Completely unpredictable. My five-year-old, Andrew, reminds me of an electron sometimes. You really just can't predict what he's going to do. And so this orbital might be a little bit like, you know, let's just say this is my house, and there's the couch, and here's Andrew's bed over here, and here's the kitchen table. And the question is, where's Andrew? Well, at any one given time, ooh, that's way too fat. Let's see. You might find him on the couch watching TV. And at night, you might find him in his bed, or you might find him in my bed, or he might be at the kitchen table eating, or he might be on the floor in the kitchen eating, or he could be in his brother's room, or maybe he's in the backyard or the front yard, where that one time when he was two, he went across the street by himself, stole the neighbor's big wheel, and drove three blocks to my brother-in-law's house. Two years old. This child is unpredictable. But if you kept doing this, you would find that he, he really does like television, and he likes to eat. Um, he prefers sleeping in my bed. Uh, he does use the bathroom, but sometimes he uses the tree. And so you would see these places where he's more likely to be. And if he is at home, there's probably uh, maybe a 90% chance that he's actually there. And that's what an orbital is. It's a region where the electron probably is, but it's not a container that the electron is confined to. It's just a description of where the electron usually is, but very unpredictable. Electrons are incredibly squirrely. So orbits just had a number, one, two, three, four, five. Orbitals have numbers and letters. So we kept with the number n, quantum number, one, two, three, etc. And as the quantum number increases, the energy increases. And the distance from the nucleus increases. So the, the orbital is getting larger and larger and larger. But there's also a letter. The letter specifies, um, you know, the number is the principal <coughs> shell. The letter is the subshell. So it's a subcategory within that principal shell. And this tells us the shape of the orbitals. And the possible letters are S, P, D, and F. These have historical significance. That's why they're not A, B, C, D. I think students would prefer that, but this is what they are. I think I looked up S once, and I can't remember what it was. But P is principal, D is diffuse, F is fine. And that had to do with characteristics of the lines that were seen in the emission spectrum of hydrogen. So there is a reason for that. So the 1S orbital. One is the principal quantum number, the, the main number for this orbital, um, the shell, and here's the S designation. The S orbitals are spherical. This is the lowest energy one. So in a hydrogen atom with only one electron, they're, they're generally going to be in their lowest energy state. So that electron is going to hang out in the 1S orbital. And here is a picture or a dot representation of a 1s orbital. So this is a little like the picture I drew with Andrew as orange dots. And if you took a picture and identified where the electron is at you know, different times, you would end up with a picture like this, that most of the time the electron is in this spherical region centered around the nucleus. And so the density of the dots represents the probability of finding an electron. So here's where the electron is most of the time. We can also represent it as a geometric shape. 
geometric shape easier to oops easier I went too far easier to draw but gives us the false impression that it's a like a container like a hamster ball or something for the electron and that's that's not at all true these are actually very complicated mathematical functions of probability that describe where the electrons are so that when we draw a sphere that represents the volume within which the electron is found 90% of the time. So 90% of the time the electron will be inside of that, but we expect it to be outside 10% of the time. And so here are the two different models uh, superimposed. And so we see there are a fair number of dots outside of that sphere. Any questions about the 1s orbital? This is weird stuff especially if you've never heard it before. So, hydrogen atom has one electron. If we're talking about an undisturbed hydrogen atom, we're not zapping him with electric current or anything, not superheating him or anything, just sitting at room temperature, that one electron is going to be in that lowest energy orbital. And that's called the ground state, or lowest energy state. Electrons, like many things, often seek out the lowest energy uh, state available, right? When a ball rolls down the hill, it stops at the bottom. It might go up the other side, but it'll come back down and it'll rest at the bottom because that's where the potential energy is the lowest. If the electron absorbs energy, then it may jump to a higher energy orbital, and that's called an excited state. So there are parallels with the Bohr model. The Bohr model is much easier to visualize. So we've got excited states, it's jumping to a higher energy orbital, and then it will come back down. So all atoms will have one ground state with all the electrons in the lowest possible levels, but they can have many, many different excited states because those higher energy orbitals are always there whether there's an electron in them or not. They're just waiting for an electron to jump up into them. So the n, equal, n equals 1 principal shell or level has one subshell. That's the S. That's what we've talked about, the spherical one. The next level is n equals 2. n equals 2 principal shell has two sublevels. It has s and p. So it has a 2s orbital, same shape as the 1s orbital, but bigger. It's slightly larger. And then it also has a p orbital, which has a different shape. The p subshell actually has three different orbitals in it. Um, and these are shaped kind of like two balloons or a dumbbell. And they are perpendicular to each other. So this one's along the x-axis, this one's along the y-axis, and this one's along the z-axis, the vertical axis. So they have different orientations. They don't overlap with each other. They are you know, around each other. They're centered on the same nucleus, but they don't actually overlap. So the number of subshells in a given principal shell is equal to n. So n equals 1 has one subshell. 2 has two subshells. 3 has three subshells. 4 has four subshells. That's nice, huh? So these are the four different types of subshells, s, p, d, and f. So the first one just has s. The second one has s and p. The third is s, p, and d. The fourth is s, p, d, and f. This reminds me of a hotel. My husband thinks this is a crazy analogy, but it's the best I've got. Have you ever been to Las Vegas? There's some really weird architecture in Las Vegas. There's one particular casino that's shaped like a pyramid, and it's all like gold reflective glass. It's, pardon me, what? The Luxor? Yeah, it's really cool looking. So this is kind of like an upside down one of those. So on, this is the first floor of the hotel and the second floor and the third floor and the fourth floor. 
And if you want to stay on the higher floors, they cost more money to stay on. Electrons are cheap. They don't have an unlimited amount of money. So when the electron goes to stay in this hotel, it's going to stay in the cheapest room available, which means it's going to stay in this S room, if possible, on the first floor. So each of these subshells is like a room in a hotel. So the first floor has one room, the second floor has two rooms, the third floor has three rooms, the fourth floor has four rooms. It's not a real big hotel, right? Um, so the n equals three principal shell or floor in the hotel has three subshells or rooms, S, P, D, and F. The S and P subshells have three S and three orbitals. They're going to be similar in shape. The S is spherical. The P is shaped like a dumbbell. They're just going to be larger. And the D subshell has five D orbitals, and they're shaped like this. I show you this, but I'm not going to make you know this. So it's a little bit like the P orbitals in that we've got these lobes but now we've got all these different, it's got four lobes in different combinations, and then there's this really bizarre guy right there. Looks like a child with a floaty ring around their waist or something. Those are the three D orbitals. So the orbitals, let me go back to this. The orbitals are what actually hold the electrons, and in my hotel, those are the beds. So the D subshell, let me write this out here, not in black though. So the third floor has three rooms. And they're not numbered, they're given letters, S, P, and D. And these rooms, the S room has one bed in it, the P room has three beds, the D room has five beds. So that D subshell has five orbitals. The orbitals are what actually hold the electrons. So that D room has five beds. It's five beds. How many people can sleep in a bed generally? Two. We're talking double queen king bed here. Two people, right? I think we'll get back to that. An electron configuration is kind of a shorthand way of indicating where the electrons are in this whole mess of orbitals and subshells and things. It's a little bit like the hotel um, clerk at the front desk, right? He needs to know who's staying in each of the rooms. So when somebody else comes, he can send them to an empty room, right? Instead of giving them a key for, you know, the newlywed couple on the third floor or something. That would be embarrassing. So this is how we, we indicate the presence of or the arrangement of the electrons. So for hydrogen, it only has one electron. And so we tell what orbital it is. This is on the first floor, the first level and it's the s orbital, and then as a superscript, the number of electrons that are in there. So this is like saying it's the first floor, the s room, and there's one person staying in it, one electron. That's an electron configuration. We also have orbital diagrams, which are more like pictures. I like pictures. An orbital diagram gives similar information but now we're going to show the electrons as arrows in boxes. And so this is almost like I've drawn little boxes to represent the beds in each of these rooms. And so here's the bed in the 1S room, and there's one person sleeping in it. It's a little arrow. The box represents the 1S orbital. The arrow represents the one electron. This is one of those subjects that you kind of have to hear through it and then maybe go listen to this again on YouTube. And hopefully the second time you listen to it, it'll make a little more sense. Do not expect you to understand this the first time. In the orbital diagrams, the direction of the arrow represents electron spin. This is a fundamental property of electrons. Um, 
So you could think of it as electrons that spin to the right and electrons that spin to the left. Or in the, in the hotel, I think of them as men and women, right? They're both people, but they're different, right? So two electrons, one with a positive spin, one with a negative spin. So we indicate those as up arrows and down arrows. And something called the Pauli exclusion principle says that orbitals can hold no more than two electrons with opposing spins. So this is like the fire marshal for the town in which this crazy hotel is saying, OK, in your hotel, you can have no more than two people in a bed, and it has to be a male and a female. There's no morality associated with that. It's just what this guy decided. Has to be positive spin, negative spin for the electrons. Okay? So we symbolize that as two arrows pointing in opposite directions. So let's draw. Um, we're going to do the orbital diagrams first. We'll do orbital diagrams and electron configurations for helium and for lithium. So we looked at hydrogen. Let's look at helium. How many electrons does helium have? Two, right? It's element number two. That means it has two electrons. So helium has two electrons. So the orbital diagram, I'm going to make a box for that first orbital. That's on the first floor, the S room, the, the first principal energy level. There's only one subshell. And so I need to put two electrons in here. They have to have opposite spins. So I'm going to draw one as an up arrow and one as a down arrow. So there's, there's the orbital diagram. This is like the, you know, the guy at the hotel front desk, and he's drawing little pictures of where the people are sleeping. That's the orbital diagram. Electron configuration is where we don't draw pictures. We give the name of that subshell. And then as a superscript, we tell how many electrons are in that subshell, in that room. This room only has one bed. It can hold two people. How many electrons does lithium have? Lithium has three. So we're going to have to look at the 1s room. And we're going to put one two electrons in there, but you can only have two electrons there. Now we're going to have to go to the next most expensive room, the next higher energy level orbital. That's going to be the second level and the S subshell. And again, there's one bed. So two S, and there's going to be one electron in there, and that guy gets the bed to himself. Is this making any sense? Maybe even just as some weird game with strange rules. The electron configuration abbreviates this. So we go 1s, and we ask ourselves, how many arrows in the box? There's two. And then we've got 2s. How many arrows in that box? One. This is a situation where chemists do write the number one. So you do write a one there. Any questions? When we have electrons with more than when we have electrons, when we have atoms with more than one electron, which is most of them, right? Hydrogen's the only one that only one electron. When there are multi electrons, the subshells within the principal shell do not have the same energy because there are electron electron interactions. Basically, just take my word for it. So now what's going on here is this is the first level, n equals 1. There's one subshell. The second level is not all equal. The, the 2s subshell is a little lower in energy than the 2p subshell. The 2p subshell has three orbitals in it. The 2p room has three beds, and each bed could hold two people. But if you're staying in the 2p room, it's going to cost a little bit more than in the 2s room. And then on the third floor, there's the 3s room and the 3p room. The s rooms always have one bed. The s subshells have one orbital. 
the P subshell has three orbitals, regardless of what level it is. And then there's another subshell. There's another room. This room has five beds. There's a lot of beds in one hotel room. Really nice for my family, but two of them are mostly gone now anyway. That's beside the point. As a result of electron-electron interactions, this subshell here is a little higher in energy than the 4s. And I know this makes everything a little more complicated, but we're not doing this to make things easy. We're describing what actually exists, so we just have to deal with it. So the 3D room actually costs more than the 4s room. So electrons are going to fill in increasing order of energy. So they're going to fill up this one first, then they're going to go to this one, then that one, then this one, and then that one. This is a good picture to have handy, just to help you remember the order of filling of these different electrons' orbitals. So let's write the electron configuration in the orbital diagram for carbon. So carbon has how many electrons? Six electrons. So carbon, there's carbon. Let's draw some boxes. I prefer the orbital diagram first. I should probably fix the slides, but it's not going to happen. So there's one S, and there's two S. And after 2s comes 2p. And we usually draw that in the orbital diagram as three boxes together. So in my hotel analogy, this is three beds in one room. The s has each one orbital, and the p has three orbitals. And so this is 2p. And on the second energy level, that's all there is. After that, you have to go up to the third energy level. So let's see if we can get all of our electrons in these boxes. So we're going to go with the lowest energy one first, and we're going to put two electrons in there, and then this one, and we'll get two electrons in there. So that's four electrons. We have two left. So we'll put one in here. And now let's think about the behavior of people in a hotel room. There's no romance involved here, OK? It's just people sleeping in a hotel room. So here's one person. They took this bed. The, uh, another person comes in. It's just going to be the two people in this room with three beds. And they are not interested in each other. Where's that second person going to sleep? In a different bed, right? If you're not romantically attached to that person, you don't want to share a bed unless you have to, right? So. This electron will go in a separate orbital because it can. It's like riding a public bus. You get on the bus, if there's empty seats, if you don't know anybody on the bus, you really should take an empty seat rather than sitting right next to, I mean, hip to hip with a perfect stranger, right? Once there's a person in every seat, then it's very socially acceptable to sit next to a stranger. But until then, it isn't. I used to watch people. I, I rode the bus when I was in college, and I used to watch people. And some people would get on the bus, and they just had no idea about bus etiquette. It was really funny. Anyway, electrons understand buses. So there we go. And this business of taking your own bed illustrates what's called Hun's rule. When filling orbitals of equal energy, electrons fill them singly first with parallel spins. And so we always draw the up arrows first, and then when we have to pair them up, we draw the down arrow. OK? So that's the orbital diagram. What would be the electron configuration? I don't leave much room. I'll draw it, draw it at the bottom. 1s, how many? 2. 2s, 2. 2p, 2. This guy could go up to 6. Right? You could have up to six electrons in this fused trio of boxes. So that's the electron configuration for carbon. Yes? So do we not have to notate that it's carbon on the second example? Um, no, you don't. I, you don't actually have to do it here. I'm just kind of writing that down 
for anybody who didn't realize that carbon was C, maybe? I don't know. Good question. Any other questions? This is one way to remember the filling order. I'm going to show you another way on the periodic table a little bit later. But doing it this way, you, you just write out 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, and then it just keeps going on. And then to decide the order of filling, you draw diagonal lines. And so you go through 1s, and then you jump back up. 2s, 2p, 3s, 4p, 4s, etc. So you just trace it like that. That works great for some people. I prefer the look at the periodic table method. All of this is hidden in the periodic table. It's very, very cool. So in summary, lower energy orbitals fill before higher energy orbitals. The cheap rooms in the hotel fill up before the expensive room. Who's going to pay $500 a night for a room if you can pay $75, right? Orbitals can hold no more than two electrons each. This is the fire marshal's idea, right? It's not safe. And when two orbitals occupy the same orbital, they must have opposing spins. So I, I equated spins to gender, but you could also think of, you know, if, if these are all guys, well, they wouldn't even sleep in the same bed. They'd sleep on the floor. Anyway, um, what did happen at Fort Snelling, at least, in Minnesota back in the 1800s, mostly to keep warm, they had twin-sized bunks barely even twin size, and two soldiers would sleep in them. And the way they'd sleep would be head to toe. So just like in that picture, you know, if this helps you remember it a little better, here's one soldier sleeping with his head in that direction, and the other soldier sleeps with his head at the other end. I mean, you have to deal with stinky feet, but, you know, there's no chance that you end up snuggling up to your soldier bunk mate. That could be awkward, right? So opposite spins. Um, and when you've got orbitals of identical energy available, they're going to be occupied by one electron first, and then they'll pair up. So that's the public bus etiquette rule. We'll finish this on next Tuesday. <laughs>